nobody knows what your battles are because especially us men, we don't typically share everything. We don't share all those details. That's why I'm so open about it now, just to give other men the idea and the, the, the permission to know that it's okay. And I basically just said, you don't know what people are going through. You don't know their battles. No matter what it is, dance through the day anyways. Welcome to the Building Men Podcast. I'm your host, Dennis Meralda. What's up and welcome to the Building Men Podcast. Become the strongest version of yourself. Mentally, spiritually, emotionally, and physically. What's up, brother? Anthony, usually you're in studio with me. What's going on here, bro? You're not here. I. Uh, it's just your head in the chair next to me. What happened? What the fuck, bro? Well, let me tell the audience. Um, Anthony's not here today. Uh, this was scheduled a while in advance. A couple months we had this studio date scheduled. And uh, I'm hanging out with my brother over the weekend. And he's telling me about this adventure that he's going on. On Monday morning, he's like, dude, this is fucking crazy. One of Anthony's best friends is a state trooper. And he asked Anthony if he had any plans on Monday. And Anthony's like, no, I got nothing going on. I have no plans whatsoever. And so Anthony agrees to this um, adventure that he's going on this morning. And basically what Anthony's doing right now is he was picked up this morning by a police officer from my parents' house and driven to the station And basically what they're asking Anthony to do is he has three hours to get his blood alcohol level up to 0.19. So they're going to put him through an adventure. Oh, let me get get off it. So right now it's on Anthony. I'll take it off of him again. So he's going on this adventure basically where they're just going to feed him booze for three hours. And he has to then go through a series of sobriety tests. So it's it's basically trying to norm how the, the state troopers are dealing with um, someone who has a blood alcohol level, and I don't know why it's 0.19. So r- right now, Anthony is, um, he's, you know, two hours into getting fucked up, and he's getting paid for this as well. He's getting paid to do this. So that's why he's not here right now. Let me go back to in just so the, the audience can see this fucking mess next to me. So Anthony's at, the, uh, at a police station getting drunk for money right now, um, and he totally forgot that we were in the studio today. So uh, he's going to sit here with me with all my guests, with that stupid look on his face. And um, so that's, that's uh, what's going on with my brother today. Um, so now the interviews will be solo today with me and, uh, and my guest that I have. And my first guest today is the unfiltered life coach, Craig Daigle. I wanted to welcome oh. Craig to the Building Men podcast. Thanks for being here, brother. Appreciate it. Thank you so much, Dennis. I appreciate it, my man. And uh, yeah, thanks for, uh, for sticking with me as I went through that journey with my brother right here. I, I couldn't <laughs> believe it. He's like, he's like, yeah, it's going to be awesome. This is on Monday. I'm like, bro, we're in the studio on Monday. We have four interviews on Monday. It's all day long. And he's like, oh, shit, totally forgot. And so we started talking about different things he could do, like maybe a calendar, you know, some way to schedule your life that could help you. And so we'll, you know, when he's in here tomorrow in studio, I'll, um, there'll be a little more ball busting. So I appreciate you uh, sticking with me during that. So you're in Oklahoma City right now, Craig. Yes, I am. I've been in Oklahoma for two years, but I lived my entire life in New England. So I grew up 30 minutes north of Boston uh, for 38 years of my life. So you're you're a Sox fan. I am a Sox fan. <laughs> Got it. Um, yeah. So growing up in the you know tri state area for me, I was you know I grew up a Yankees, Giants, Knicks. You know, so it was the the antithesis. Every team that you rooted against was a team that I rooted for throughout my <laughs> career as a sports fan. So what brought you from New England to Oklahoma? Why did you make that move? So my wife actually did. Um, I met her through my life change. Uh, I met her through the coaching opportunity that I have. Um, she was also part of my platform. Um, it's kind of, it's, it's a really great story actually. So it was 2018. And, um, at the time my dad had called me on a Sunday and told me that he had prostate cancer. Um, so I was kind of trying to reel, reel that around my mind. The following day on Monday, I came home and our, our dog died. At the time, I was a single father of two. I have two sons. Um, one's 15 now. And the other one's nine. 
And two days later, my grandmother had fallen in her, my mother's mother, my grandmother fallen in her apartment. She lived alone. Um, nobody knew. They found her on Friday. Oh. My aunt had went and checked on her because nobody had heard from her. She was still alive. She got rushed to the hospital. She had emergency surgery. She came out of anesthesia and uh, had a stroke. So I was a complete mess. I'm trying to wrap my mind around what's going on. And two days later, my aunt calls me and I am, I'm so consistent. Everybody knows what I'm doing at, at this time because I was a few years deep in changing my life. I was formerly overweight. I can share that part after, but I was working out. It was 5.30 in the morning and my mother's twin sister calls me, my aunt, and she's like, you're probably working out right now. And I knew something was wrong. And I'm like, look, I think you don't call me at 5.30 in the morning right. ever or, or, or anything like that. So I said, what's happening? How can I help? And she said, your grandfather passed away, their father. Uh, I wasn't ready for that because, you know, I was expecting her to say, grandma took a turn for the worst. Yeah. She's, you know, whatever. But no, my grandfather passed away. So... I let her go. I said, you know, let me know how I can help because I was a very firm believer. I was really deep in personal development, personal growth at that time. Um, I had lost 130 pounds at that point. And I really dug deep and I, I just realized that there are things outside of my control that I can't handle, right? You know, life is 10% what happens to you, 90% how you react to it. And I knew there was nothing I could do other than say, let me know if there's anything that I could do. So I went and finished my workout. Most people would have, you know, shut it off and done something else at that point. But I finished the workout and I controlled my controllable at that point. And when I finished the workout, I was in a group of about 50,000 people. We were in a test group for a new at-home fitness program. And I posted in the group that nobody knows what your battles are because especially us men, we don't typically share everything. We don't share all those details. That's why I'm so open about it now, just to give other men the idea and the, the, the permission to know that it's okay. And I basically just said, you don't know what people are going through. You don't know their battles, no matter what it is, dance through the day anyways. And I can't dance. It was a little video clip of me just kind of dancing after my workout covered in sweat. And this woman in the group, she posted um, on the thread and come to find out she had posted it and deleted it and then reposted it uh, because she wasn't sure. And she prayed over me. And it wasn't like that typical praying for you comment that you see on social media or prayers up or she literally wrote out a prayer and, and, and asked, you know, Dear father of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, like it specifically spoke to the God that she was speaking to and just asked him to shine his face upon me and to guide me through what I was going through, to give me strength and perseverance. I didn't know this woman. I didn't know her at all. And I was so moved by the fact that someone took time out of their day, especially me from where I came from. I was coming out of a divorce uh, three years prior from domestic violence and being married to an addict and an alcoholic. I wasn't used to that. And I knew that I needed to track her down and thank her. <laughs> she had one picture on her social media and like two posts and it was like of food. And I swore it was probably like a fake account from like some bearded dude in the middle East or something. I swear that's what went through my mind. Right. So I finally just messaged and I was like, hey, uh, I want to thank you for that prayer. You don't know how much it means to me. It, it meant a lot that you took the time to intentionally write words to me that were meaningful. Um, and I said, I don't know where you live. I don't know who you are. But if you're local to me, I'd love to take you out for coffee or lunch or something, whatever I can do to repay you. And it was a voice clip that I sent her. And she sent a voice clip back, and it was this southern accent, Oklahoma. I didn't know Oklahoma at the time, and she just said, oh, you're funny. You're welcome. I just, I could tell, I could see the pain in your face in your video, or 
And, you know, it was just such a heartfelt thing. And we hit it off. We hit it off from there. And, um, you know, the, the rest is history. A couple of years later, I'm now in Oklahoma full time now. We have a baby together. And it's it's been such a blessing. I'm just so grateful that God brought her into my life, man. Isn't that amazing? You were going through this challenging experience, um, you know, with your grandmother being in the hospital, the loss of your grandfather. You decide to continue your workout and you're, fuck it, I'm going to post something right now. And that one decision that you made changed the trajectory of your life. And it's probably so many different ways. Uh, there's, it's, it's really remarkable to me. And, you know, as people are listening, these little tiny decisions that you make, um, you know, can change the the course of of your future and then so many other people's futures the book the alchemist um uh the the author uh it's paulo coelho colo is i'm not sure if that's how you pronounce it but basically he says that people don't realize that every single human being plays an integral role in the outcome in the history of the world and we have to recognize that that this moment you know changed everything you mentioned craig that um, you know, you went through this transformational journey and you, the date that you have is, um, you know, you started it, it, you mentioned 2015. So first I want to, I want to get to that point in your life when you, when you decided to make these, um, you know, physical, mental, emotional, spiritual changes in your life. So talk to me a little bit about, you mentioned that you were overweight, you were for, like 400 pounds or something like that. Talk to me about like, yeah. as you grew up, were you the heavy kid growing up all the time or did it kind of slowly creep into your life as you were growing up? Yeah, so I was a gym rat. I was athletic. Um, I played sports. I was relatively fit. I was in great shape up until about 26 years old. I'm 40 now. Up until about 26 years old, um, I had my first son and that relationship didn't work out. Um, I basically caught her being unfaithful. Um, we had split. I actually had ended up with full custody uh, of him, you know, through all of our court cases and everything that, that went on um, and found myself a single father. And the stress of family court and, I mean, I can, I can only speak for where the state that I was in, and I know that most states are very similar. I hear these stories all the time. Um, family court isn't very fair to anyone, um, not just men, but anyone. They just they don't they don't have the time and the patience for family court because there are so many cases that I feel like they just kind of have a set standard that they rule on and just go with it. So it was very stressful. And I turned to food, I turned to food, I turned to drinking, I was drinking heavily. Um, and the weight went on fast. And I was overweight for uh, probably 10 years. Um, after I had split from her, I had met my ex wife, I was never married to the first woman. Um, we were together eight years married three we had a, a son together. Um, and then August 11th, 2015 was our final domestic. I just, I couldn't take it anymore. She was addicted to prescription medication. She was drinking all the time. She was hiding it. Um, it was very detrimental and unhealthy. And the reason that I stayed in that I told myself that I stayed in was for our kids, um, for my stepdaughter, her daughter, and for my son, and then the son that we had together. And I just kind of accepted the way life was you know it was kind of like the devil that i knew it was right. what i thought my life was going to be as a man that was over 400 pounds i wasn't exactly you know prime pick to go restart my life and have a new family you know what i mean like that that was what went through my head so basically like that that final domestic was like the the straw that broke the camel's back dennis like it was unbearable it went on from 5 p.m at night until about 6 a.m uh multiple calls to the police um her breaking in the windows of our apartment it was just it was a terrible night for all of us then november of 2015 my stepdaughter of eight years she was taken out of my care out of my custody um my ex-wife had signed 
parental rights over to her parents, to her uh, mother. And they basically just kind of took her out of our life. Um, even though, you know, I was taking care of all the kids. Um, I had all of them full time. I was just me, single dad from August to November, getting them to school, working full time. I worked at a hospital 40 minutes from our house um, in the engineering department. And I was just kind of going through the motions, man, trying to make it work. And my health was way on the back burner. Like my, my focus and my thought process was I have to support everybody. I can't take care of myself and take care of everybody else, which is completely false. I know that now, um, but so many people fall into that realm where they're like, I do all this stuff for everybody else. I don't have time for myself. Well, guess what? You're not giving 100% of yourself to those people around you because you don't have the capacity to do so. If you're not taking care of yourself, your own sleep, your own health, you're showing up at 50 or 60%. So even though you feel like you're doing all these things for everybody else, you're not giving them the best of you because you never took care of yourself first. And I think that I know for, for a fact, it's more so uh, women than men. Um, men do it too, but women get that mom guilt. Dads get the dad guilt too, you know, where they feel like, if I do something for myself, it takes away from my kids. Well, no, you need to take care of yourself, right? So once she was taken away from us, that was kind of like almost rock bottom where I was like, wow, like what what's else? this? What, what I was questioning whether or not I was capable of handling things. I was questioning my existence. I was questioning I don't believe that I was suicidal, but I felt as if m my kids' lives would have been better if I was gone, right? And I got to the point where I just kind of did a cry for help on social media, and I couldn't go to a gym. I didn't have time. I couldn't go anywhere. I just said, does anybody have an at-home workout DVD that I can borrow? And a, a friend at the hospital said, I have one. I'll bring it in tomorrow. So she brought it in for me. Um, I brought it home. It was the end of November. It was around Thanksgiving. You know, I'm not planning on doing a workout. I'm already telling myself January 1st, New Year's, that's going to be my day. I'm already pushing it off. Right. I'm over 400 pounds. I'm stubborn. You know, uh, I don't know where to start. And I'm telling myself January 1st, here we go. So it sat on the counter for about a week. The morning of December 1st. I woke up at about 3 30, 4 o'clock in the morning, um, and I was choking. Uh, I had severe sleep apnea. I had acid reflux. I had high blood pressure, and I slept with a, a CPAP. So I had the mask on, and I'm, I'm choking on the mask. I'm, I'm over 400 pounds. I can't get out of bed. Um, I ripped the, the machine off the nightstand trying to get up to breathe. I run to the bathroom and I'm literally kneeling on the floor, you know, gasping, but not breathing. And I'm dry heaving over the toilet because my throat's on fire. And I just remember tears coming down my eyes. I pulled myself up on the sink and I looked in the mirror and I started just praying to God to let me live. I just prayed that I could make it. And I remember gasping and getting a little bit of air at that moment. And I threw the medicine cabinet open and I ate a whole sleeve of antacids. Now I can't breathe and I'm putting things in my mouth. It's not a, especially chalky antacids. Right. Like now my throat's really clogged up, but I got to get the fire out because I, I can't breathe with the fire there because it's constricting my throat. So I knew that I needed the antacids. I'm drinking the sink water and I just got my mouth under the sink. And I remember when my lungs finally filled with air and I felt alive again and I'm red in the face tears just streaming down my face and I looked in the mirror I had my shirt off I'm wearing the, like the only pair of gym shorts that I had that fit me and I just I felt disgusted with myself I felt completely disgusted and I walked into the bedroom I grabbed my cell phone and I literally, I, I took a picture of myself in the mirror and I'll send it to you and you, you can share it when you post this, this podcast. But 
I took a picture of myself. I looked at myself in the mirror and I said, this is the last day that we're going to look like this. This is the last day that this is going to happen. And I, I walked out into my living room and I threw in an at-home DVD and it was the trainer that did insanity. And I'm like, okay, 400 pounds. I'm going to do cardio in my living room. And five minutes in, I couldn't do anything. I, could, I couldn't keep up with them. I was winded. And I told myself, I'm like, look, just stay moving. It was a 25 minute workout. Just stay moving. When I couldn't do what they were doing, I marched in place. I tried my best to do what they were doing. I tried my best to keep up. And I just realized, I just, I had said to myself, it doesn't matter how fast they go. As long as you stay moving, it's better than nothing because you weren't doing anything before. And I finished it. And I remember thinking to myself, wow, I was only able to like do a few of the moves. I was only able to keep up. But when I wasn't doing the moves, I was marching in place. So I kept my heart rate up. The following day I got up, same time, did another one. The next day, did another one. I did an eight week program. I lost about 70 pounds doing that program. Um, and it just continued. And I had the opportunity presented to me to be a representative of the company and to help other people and help guide them through the programs to help guide them through the nutrition and stuff. And that's what I've been doing ever since I've been helping other people overcome their adversities by just understanding the simple fact that we are not a victim of our circumstance, because I truly believe that we are a victim once after that, we're a volunteer. And I was done volunteering to be where I was at. I was done. I needed to change it. And I was ready. Oh, the, that response was um, such a deep look into your journey. Uh, it resonates with me a lot. If you know people have listened to this podcast, I had something similar where I had that moment where you know I look in the mirror and I like it, where I decided no more. Like no mas, there's this is not going to be who I am anymore. So the the fact that there's a timestamp and here's the other thing people say december or january 1st that's when we're going to start something new it's today is the day if you're listening and you're you're yeah. sure you're on the fence use this as the catalyst to whatever it is that you've been putting off if it's you know getting in, back in shape if it's starting a you know a, a college program whatever it is that's out there use today as that day to start it whenever this is going to air so december 1st is your day and you have a near death experience pretty much. I mean, you, you, if it, yeah. it might've gone a little bit of a different way if you didn't have the antacids there or me, it could have been, it could have been your last day on this planet. So the big thing is now you make this decision. Okay. I'm going to get up and every day I'm going to do it. And insanity, is that Sean T? Yes. Yep. Cause I actually went to college yep. with him. I was, uh, I was in college at, at Rowan in the, um, in the late nineties and Sean T was a, was a trainer there and he would do like, aerobics classes pretty much so i remember you know seeing sean t there that's that's pretty funny that that was the guy that was the guy that was talking to you he, and he is very motivational so now you're getting up every day and this is like you're getting into this routine so let's start with just the initial parts of that was there once you started and you made that decision was it just every day it's you know the sun rises the alarm goes off or whatever and i do it or did you have some times during that, that first eight weeks where you're like, oh, man, like I really want a fucking Big Mac right now in a, you know, in a six pack? So it's, you know, it's it's 100 percent mindset. It is absolutely 100 percent all in our head. Um, I tell people that anybody can lose weight. Anybody can get healthy. But if you don't work your heart and your mind at the same time, you're just going to be a different version of your broken self. So I never wanted to get out of bed. I was overweight, depressed, unhealthy, lazy. <laughs> I mean, I worked full time. I worked uh, anywhere from 60 to 70 hours a week and I was a single parent. So the only time that I had to work out was if I got up earlier. So that means less sleep. So I had to make this conscious decision where I was like, okay, you know what? Um, I leave for work and drop kids off at, you know, early care and school because I had to be to work by 7, 38 o'clock. Um, I knew that I had to get up at five. I knew that at five o'clock I would get up, you know, wake up, 
pre-workout, relax for a minute, turn it on, do the workout, shower, kids' lunches. Like I didn't have time to waste. So I always tell people that motivation is BS. It's It literally is because um, motivation will literally only get you started. I was motivated to not die. That was what got me to do the first workout. Discipline is what continued to get me to do it. Um, I changed my eating right away because I knew that you can't outwork a poor diet. I just, I knew that because I had tried in the past. For 10 years, I yo-yoed and did every fad diet, pill, fat burner that was on the market. If you've seen on Dr. Oz some type of fat loss uh, gimmick, I tried them. I tried everything because my willingness to change wasn't greater than my acceptance of the way my life was at that point. And I kept lying to myself. I kept telling myself I would do whatever it took. But the clause at the end of it was I would do whatever it took as long as I didn't have to try hard. That was the problem. And I recognized that in order for me to change my health, it was going to suck. It was going to be hard work. And I had to be willing to choose my hard. Well, 400 pounds in a CPAP with high blood pressure and uh, acid reflux and almost dying, that was hard. Being a single dad and being embarrassed to take your kids to a kid's birthday party because all the other kids pointed at you and called you fat, that was hard. Not being able to sleep at night and wear a mask, that was hard. You know, everything about my life was already hard. I decided to choose which one, uh, which hard I wanted to do. And, and that was simply just getting up every day, not wanting to work out, but doing it anyways. And then it eventually turned into a habit. It turned into a healthy habit where maybe I don't like cardio still six years almost later, but I know that it's good for my body. I know that it's good for my heart. I know that it's good for me to be the father my kids deserve. So that was the push. That was the legitimate push. But the thing that will really help you going is a support system, support and accountability. And you know that's one of the foundations of, of what I do w within our team, um, within our network and, and what we do. Um, it's been an absolute blessing because I get to see it. I get to see when somebody's not feeling it and be able to shoot them a message and be like, hey, you know, you said you wanted this change. I, I need you to I need you to give me a little bit of effort today. I'm, I'm here to support you. I know that times are hard. I know that things are rough, but just know that you're not alone. And sometimes that's just enough. Right. That's just enough for us is to know that we're not alone. It's uh, the, what you mentioned about there's the, the physical part of it, but unless you're consciously looking at your heart and your mind, the physical, it will, it'll go up and down. Like you, whatever it is, you lose weight, you get back in shape, unless you're doing the work on the shit that got you there in the first place, then it's all gonna, it, it doesn't mean anything, right? So as you're going through this eight week program, at the same time, are you now really recognizing all the shit that you've been through in an abusive relationship? Are you doing the work simultaneously or did you lose the weight and you're like, fuck, like there's still this hole here that I need to, I need to work on. So I started working on the hole right away. Um, but it's, it took years. Like the hole, the hole didn't get patched, uh, in a short amount of time. And, and even now still, there are still, you know, unhealthy habits will creep back, uh, unhealthy thoughts. It's, it's almost like, it's almost like being in recovery for people that have, have been through addiction can understand that you have those moments where you could go back. Um, because I was a food addict, you know, um, it's not like somebody telling you, okay, it's okay to have a little bit of crack to survive. Right. Well, you can't just have like a little bit of food to survive. You have to have a certain amount. You have to face food every single day. Um, and it, it was it was difficult because my habits were less than safe. It was simple, quick, and easy. So fast food, um, you know, frozen, whatever I could just whip up. My kids were unhealthy too by proxy because I was unhealthy. So... I really started working on it right away. And I really recognized, cause man, I was broke. So when I started doing it as a single father, I'm 
like I was literally unsuccessfully evicted from my apartment for two years straight, going through court and going through everything. Um, I paid my bills late every other month and rotated them so that my car didn't get repossessed, so that the lights stayed on, so that I could feed my kids. And there was a moment where I wasn't really sure what I was going to do. And this is like one of those leap of faith moments. Um, it was when I was presented with the opportunity of, of working a business within this. Uh, I maxed out a credit card when I had no money. I literally had enough money on the credit card to basically sign up to be a representative with our company and no idea how I was going to feed my kids the following week. And I ended up helping uh, eight people, which ended up uh, allowing me to earn enough commission and, and income to buy groceries the next two weeks and gas to get to work and to not have my phone shut off. So it was like, it was all these opportunities that I had that fell into place that I just, I didn't, I didn't shy away from them. I just, I went for it. I was terrified and I leaped. I literally had this credit card as an emergency fund to feed my kids if I didn't have money one week. And I went and spent it to better my health and to be the father my kids deserved. It was hands down one of the scariest things that I ever did and it paid off. Do you have that? credit card frame somewhere in your house i would use that as a motivational tool right it's it's one of those things that you know as you go through this there's those moments where and i've been through it like holy shit like one what did i do how did i get here and you, you start going through this and in some way shape or form as long as you still believe in yourself and believe in what you're doing it will it will work out it's it's going to be okay it, it's tough to believe it in some of those moments right yeah, it was it was definitely a, a aha moment for me to realize that, you know, you even said it earlier, you know, when we were talking about January 1st, right? We take all of our hopes and dreams and we put them in this box and we label that box someday. Mm -hmm. And we stash that box labeled someday in the back corner of our head or in the deepest cavern of our memory and the problem is, is there, there isn't a day named someday. There, there isn't one. It's, it's today. And if you don't act on those things when you have the opportunity to, you're going to reach the end of your life and say, I wish I did this or I wish I did that. And I, I don't want to be that guy. I don't. So many people get to that point where, you know, they're, you know, say on their deathbed and, and they're asked, you know, what do you wish? What, you know, what's something you wish? It's, you know, people say, I wish I spent more time with family. Um, a, a common thing is I wish I did something to leave some kind of a legacy. And one of the biggest things that people talk about is they wish they'd taken more risks during their life, wish they believed and gambled in themselves instead of taking the safe route. And you did that. You definitely, you gambled on yourself and you were, you, you took, money that you didn't really have to to invest in yourself some people might have said you were crazy for doing that but it's it's paid off tenfold for you and that's one of those moments that you can look back and you have so many of these moments along on your journey that you're like i remember this specific time stamped when i had this feeling and this is how i don't want to be anymore you also mentioned this you know spiritual emotional healing that you've gone through and for me craig over the past month or so it's been about a month. Um, I had this, I was out on, um, on the West coast with my girlfriend, Julie, and we were, you know, there was, you know, something happened and I started, I went back in my mind to like an abusive situation in, um, in my relationship and in, in my marriage where the way I showed up with my girlfriend was how I would have showed up in the past. And something happened that triggered this trauma response. And I'm like, holy shit, I need to deal with this right now. Why, why did this happen? So I get out a journal and I start writing and writing and like if I, for like hours, I just wrote and I wrote a letter to myself as a 12 year old when I went through this traumatic experience that changed how I showed up in every relationship. So I'm crying in the car, writing and writing and writing. But what that did when I went through that, Craig, dealing with the trauma and understanding where it came from and why it was manifesting itself in this way. Once I was able to fully deal with it and I was able to like, okay, I'm going to take this out and put it here and look at it because that's not me anymore. What it did was all this other shit. I'm like, Oh my God, there's shit in here. I didn't even realize I moved this big box of pain out of the way 
And I'm like, I don't mm-hmm. like this other shit that's in here now. I got to deal with this stuff too. So it was almost like this emotional journey I've gone on during the past month where I started posting about it as well on, on the Building Men Instagram, just about, you know, men dealing with abuse in their in their marriage and, and being able to talk about that and normalize it. It's one in four men has dealt with an abusive situation. How many men don't say anything because it's not normalized for us to do so? To say, listen, I was in an abusive relationship. It was an emotionally abusive relationship. It was a, it could have been a physically abusive relationship, but people don't talk about that shit because it's it's really hard to do so. So when you were able to, to deal with some of that trauma and move it out, were you finding other shit that you're like, oh man, now I gotta deal with this, I gotta deal with this. 100 percent 100 percent it's you know i i think that as human beings we tend to lock things away um things that that happen i think specifically as men we absolutely do that i mean i know human beings do but men mostly i think it's ego and stubbornness mostly right that keeps us and prevents us because that's what prevented me from ever saying anything in the past um I was embarrassed. I was embarrassed as a man that I was in a situation where I allowed another person, let alone a woman, treat me the way that I was and someone who I love. Right. So it, it really ate at my 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 mental capacity to understand what was going on. But I 100 percent agree, dude. Once you see, I tell people that the things that people have told you about you are not true. First of all, they're not facts. Um, things that people have done to you that you're carrying. We have all these things inside of us that we carry and it's heavy. And over time it just gets heavier. The moment that you set it down, like you just described the moment that you set it down. Yes. There are those other bits and pieces that you uncover and unearth by moving those big rocks. Right. But, once you set it down, how much lighter did you feel? I, I mean, I, I know because I've been through it, bro. Dennis, like, I know that that moment of just not having the world on your shoulders in that moment anymore feeling. I know, I know how good it feels to take that burden that you carry and to set it down. And it doesn't mean that it's completely gone. You just right. recognize that you don't need to carry it. It doesn't serve you, right? It's so interesting. And what you said, too, about, you know, as men, it's tough for us to be vulnerable. When, when we think about masculinity, um, you know, traditionally, you know, I would think, you know, men don't cry. I grew up in a, in, a, in a household where I never saw my father cry. The first time I saw him cry was about six months ago. And... So not only did I not see him cry, it wasn't okay for me to cry. When I cr- if I cried, I was a fucking pussy. You know, that, that's what that yep. meant if, if I showed any kind of emotion that way. And I'm an emotional person. So the, the tricky part is how do, we, how do we normalize it for men to be able to understand that, you know, masculinity, part of it is being able to be vulnerable, to be strong enough to be vulnerable. It's, it's hard to do so. So what... How do we go about doing that? What's what's the, the the path that we would take if we're if we're working with someone? So to even take a client that you're working with and you understand they have this they built this brick wall up in front of them and they're not able to truly deal with their emotions. How do you how would you help someone work through that um, as you're coaching them? Well, you know, I think it's leading by example. I think it's it's men like you doing what you're doing. It's men like me that that speak about what it is that we've gone through that use our mess as a message and that continue to show up authentically, you know, raw, honest, and unfiltered the way that we do, because as we do that, that shows our vulnerability. And to be vulnerable, you're, you're open to attack. And if you make yourself open to attack with your clients by being vulnerable, they'll allow themselves to be vulnerable. Right. It's not that you're going to attack them, but it lets that defense mechanism down a little bit to let them know, hey, you know what? Maybe they they empathize because I, I, I can't understand how other people feel. I can empathize with them. I can relate to a story, but nobody can understand, you know, how you felt in your relationship right. or how I felt in my, my relationship. We can empathize with it and be like, you know, I understand why you don't feel OK about it, because I've not felt OK before in similar situations. 
Um, and typically the people that I help, man, for the most part, they're people that have had trauma. Um, and, you know, as a coach, it's extremely difficult because people that are in that space aren't always ready to work through that trauma. So, you know, it's not always a win. And as a coach and as somebody that tries to help people navigate their circumstances, you know, and, and the narratives of the stories that have been told to them about themselves their whole life by teachers or bullies or their parents even, or loved ones, it's difficult. It's difficult because not everybody is always ready. Um, you know, I'm a tough love kind of person, but I'm compassionate too, you right. know? So it's, it's been hard on me to be able to set aside my want for their change more than they do. Um, but it's taken me six years to get to where I am to understand that not everybody's ready. Everybody has their own timing, but a lot of people miss the timing. A lot of people, you know, will continue to January 1st after my birthday, yep. when I come back from vacation, uh, after my cat turns five, like whatever the right. freaking excuses, you know? And it's like, man, you can't do that. We have, we have one life. You're not promised tomorrow. You are not guaranteed tomorrow. And every single day I start my day and I try to end my day the same. I, I, I wake up with gratitude and, you know, if you're, if you're spiritual, if you have faith, if you believe in God, I, I literally wake up and I say, thank you, God, for another day alive. Thank you for these legs that are about to get me out of bed. Some people are not capable of doing that today. Thank you for the ability to work on my mindset because some people don't have the mental capacity to do so. Thank you for allowing me another opportunity today to be better than I was yesterday. And then I go about my day and I try to end my day the same way. If you start and end your day with gratitude, you're more likely to be able to react properly when the shit hits the fan, because it's not a matter of, of if it's when it's, it's going to happen. It's it's, there's no if, but the thing is, is I think that a lot of people search for the gratitude in their day because they don't have it. If you start and end it with gratitude, you're not searching for it when you need it. And you're more apt to react properly when the stuff happens right. to you case in point, when my grandfather passed away, I just, I had the capacity to set aside. Did I grieve? Yeah, I cried through my entire workout. Like, I was upset. But it didn't stop me from living because I needed to continue, right? What if you, if that happened in May of 2015, you know, how, how would it have been different for you if your grandmother was in the hospital and your grandfather died before you went through your separation and your divorce? Oh, I would have been a mess. I, I... I, I know for a fact I wouldn't be where I am today had things yep. panned out the way that um, you just described. No way. You also mentioned, Craig, about going through that separation and divorce. I just wanted to bring it back to that really quickly. You said that you stayed in this marriage because it was about your kids. You know, and I that's exa that resonates with me so deeply. Um, you know, I, I stayed uh, for a long time because the kids, I was like, you know, I need, I don't want my kids to grow up in a broken family. Divorce can be considered a trauma. And if I'm doing something um, that's putting them in more of a precarious situation growing up because living in two different households, or maybe I won't be able to see my kids for whatever reason. So that, that was such a motivating factor for me to stay in, in a, in a marriage that was it was not a healthy relationship at all so that really resonates with me but i think what i've learned over the past month i mentioned i went on this kind of emotional dive what i needed to do with my kids is have deep conversations with them about what they saw how they saw me showing up for such a long period of time which was in a very weak and passive way allowing things to happen to me without standing up and fighting back and um you know, speaking my truth. So I had an opportunity to, to go back and rewrite those stories, one to myself and then to my kids. And that to me was such um, an, a life changing experience to go through and it needed to happen. I, I don't want, I wanted them to see like shitty things are going to happen to you. 
it's it's inevitable like we, you know we're going to experience difficult things how do we internalize that how how do we take whatever shitty thing happens what story do we tell ourselves um and then how how does it play out how do we show up in relationships moving forward from that so you mentioned that you know that that was one of the reasons why you stayed it really hit home with me and it was one of those things that going through that self-discovery period over the last month it was so apparent that that's what i was doing and uh, so I appreciate you you mentioning that. I really, really do. I, I guarantee, Dennis, most men in the abusive relationships with children, that's what we're telling ourselves. I, I don't, I, I literally don't, I mean, especially those of us that are uh, involved fathers, okay? I'll, I'll say that because, you know, the realization came after when I really sat down and thought about it, all of our children are better off. They don't need to live through that stuff. My, my kids were there for physical and, and verbal altercations. My kids seen a lot of it. My kids were a part of some of it. You know, like they they watched these things happen and they don't need that. They just need to be able to be children. They need to be able to, um, you know, not have a bad picture of either of their parents, regardless of who they are because a child loves them both no matter right. what right and you know we shouldn't ever influence how they feel about one another and we should never put them in that situation so i i agree man and and i appreciate you sharing that you went through it too it just it reminds me and us that we're not alone dude we 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 go through these similar situations and i think if there's a man that sees this if you're in an abusive relationship and you're telling yourself you're doing it for your kids, understand that your kids would be so much better off with a, a healthy, not depressed, um, and happier father figure in their life. Whether you live in the same house as them or you move away and get that quality time, that healthy time together versus the unhealthy right. all the time. And just them growing up, not feeling the angst of mm -hmm. of those interactions i know i i for years i felt the, the trauma i would feel it in my chest and a lot of it was like professionally but you know a lot of it was also personal trauma that i was experiencing and i would i would feel it in my chest and it would like kind of it felt like it seized up in my heart and it stayed there like a ton of bricks on my chest all the time and i just i walked around in this slumped over slouchy way and I remember my mom talking to me within the last year, and she was like, it, it always seemed like you were hungover. You just, you had this the way about you, it was kind of like an Eeyore way. You were, it just always looked like you had just come off a fucking bender, and you were, you were really hungover. And you weren't, but that's just how you kind of showed up. And now, I mean, speaking with people that knew me back before I was married and then saw me go through this deterioration and they see me again they're like oh I remember you you're Dennis I remember this guy you, you know you, you were a guy that I used to fucking hang out with in college or whatever and I haven't seen you in, in a long time even if they have they haven't really seen me so being able to show up in a way for your kids where they can take a step back and look at you and say that is my dad that's the guy that's the guy right there you mentioned uh, as we were getting to know each other today craig that you have you have sons um and you, you know their they their ages range up to 15 years old so you have a you know a little one at home up through 15. um what i do i have i have four sons so i have a 15 year old i have a 10 year old stepson a nine year old and then we have a two-year-old. That's a big, and that's like me and my brother, <laughs> right, Anthony? Where are you? There you are. We're fourteen years, uh, fourteen years difference between the two of us. There, there is a thirteen-year, you know, gap between between the, you know, your your oldest and your youngest. What are the lessons that they need as young men um, that you've learned that you wish you knew when you were, you know, going through it? What's a lesson that you wish that you learned that you think your sons need to learn? Um, I, I, th I think that, you know, my sons get a lot from a bunch of different areas. So my oldest son, he's got a great stepdad, um, who's, who's a good father figure too in, in the house. Um, but I have a great support system here in Oklahoma, so we're not alone. I think that 
I wish I seen more adult males come together and, you know, share what we should be doing as men um, to, you know, rear us with, with discipline, to, to rear us. You know, man, in the last 18, 19 months or whatever of the world, just watching the collapse of society, um, I don't want them to have a societal worldview. I want them, I, you know, we're kind of trying to instill a biblical worldview in our young, young ones um, because there's a foundation of respect and responsibility in, um, you know, biblical literature. And I wish I had more of that when I was a kid. I wish I had more of a foundation of, you know, rights and wrongs. I was a terrible teenager. When I was a, a young man, I tormented my parents. I'm, I'm the oldest of three. Um, but me and my dad, we, we weren't that close. Like, like, we didn't talk. We worked together. And it was like everything I did was wrong. I was yelled at all day long. Like you said earlier, you know, it was suck it up, buttercup. Yeah. You know, you scrape, scrape yourself, rub dirt on it. Don't cry. Don't show emotion. You need to work hard. You need to be a man, you know, with no example of what a man was supposed to be. You know, it's, you know, don't get me wrong. My father is a great dude. He is an even better grandfather now with uh, all the young ones and yeah. everything. And it's like, it's not that he was wrong. It's just he wasn't shown. He didn't have his dad in the house. You know, he had he had a stepfather in the house. And I don't think that we as men step up and up and lead by example, you know, um, be that head, disciple your children, teach them right from wrong, teach them about respect, teach them all those things. And I just pray that my boys grow up respectful young men and that um add to society and don't take away from it i you know i, I hope that makes sense it does but, definitely and just I mean, having that idea craig where seeing men interacting with one another there's definitely there's something to that there's definitely something to having young men observe and watch men interact in a way or in a, in a positive way intentionally and part of building men is going to be a, a retreat for fathers and sons to go on together and do like an experiential type thing where it's going to be a couple days out in the woods. There's going to be really intentional things as far as, you know, building confidence and teamwork and, you know, dealing with that relational um, element between fathers and sons. And it, it and then seeing, you know, fathers interact with one another in a really, um, you know, intentional way to help teach lessons to young men. I think that that's your spot on that those things absolutely need to happen. And it's, it's also interesting when we think about, you know, what lessons we teach our kids, um, the words that we're saying, and then the actions that they see, and then what our inactions and words that we're not saying are teaching our kids as well. They pick up on, on all that shit, right? They, they pick up on everything that we're saying and not saying. So being intentional with, with those messages that we're giving to them as well. 100%. And case in point, you know, I grew up, my father was a smoker. He told us every day, uh, I better not catch you smoking. You know, I'll, I'll beat your ass or whatever type of threat came to us not to smoke. Well, once I hit like 15, I had my first cigarette and then I started smoking, you know? And it was, it was like, you know, the do, do as you're told, not as I do. Um, that doesn't work. That approach does not work. Lead by example. So my kids, they see their dad doesn't smoke. And, you know, we talk about it. They see that other people smoke and they ask me about it. And I say, yeah, I did for a period of time, but it's not healthy. It's not a healthy habit to have. Um, and I explained to them why. And I said, you know, I think that I did it because everybody around me at the time, you know, I'm 40 years old. So growing up, people were smoking in restaurants when I was a yeah. kid. People were smoking uh, at, at Wendy's and McDonald's. People were smoking at the movie theaters and stuff. Like there were cigarettes everywhere. Um, it's just up until like the last few years that, you know, you really see less and less of it. I mean, everybody's turned to like vaping now and all that stuff, but it's like, 
when, when you are surrounded by that as an example, where do you go? So I think that that's why it's so important, as you just said, be intentional with your words, with your kids. Don't tell them not to cry. Don't tell them uh, that it's not okay to show emotion. Don't, don't tell them those things that you were told when, when you were a kid. Tell them that it is okay, that it needs to have reason and serve purpose. And, and to elaborate on it, to ask them, what caused you to feel that, that way? Well, what happened that made you upset like that? You know, it's like um, one of your kids does something wrong and you take the TV away from them or the electronics and it's a meltdown and they're crying. And you say to them, why do you feel that? I just feel sad inside. So you feel upset because of a choice that you made. I want you to understand that you made the choice to not behave or to not do what you were told to do. And now the outcome makes you sad. So in order to prevent the outcome, how do we change it? Well, you don't do that first thing that caused the thing that made you sad. Right. And it, I think it registers more, you know, because I mean, you still have to discipline. There still needs to be some level of authority in your house, but talk to them about it. Of course, they're going to be upset that you took video games away. They're going to cry if they're a young child, right? Talk to them about it. Don't just leave it like that right. because you're angry or upset with them, you know? I, ho I hope that makes sense. It definitely does. Sometimes sometimes I just <laughs> speak on the <laughs> Yeah, I'll do the I'll do the same thing. There'll be times like I'll I'll start going down a journey and I'm like, "What the how did I fucking get here and how do I get out? How do I get out of where I am right now?" It's funny you mentioned about the cigarette smoking. I grew up um on 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 my mother's side of the family. Um that's that was like the fun side. You know, I like cousins that were my age and we would visit you know it was like thanksgiving and christmas like big parties together but i remember the the smoking my parents were the only ones who didn't smoke um but when we went there it was a cloud that hung like four feet off the ground of smoke all the time and it was like drinking non-stop and smoking and i have, I have memories of driving home from they were down the shore driving home christmas eve night crying because of the smoke in my eyes I'm like wow, well, there's smoke in my eye. like I, I I still remember that. And yeah. I, for me, I with the with smoking too. I I just I, I laughed. I went on this journey as we were talking. Do you remember the, even the cars? They had the little push button cigarette lighters and the ashtrays. And I you mentioned you started smoking when you were 15. I don't know if I ever told told this story on Building Men ever, but I, you know now's a, now's as good of a time as any. I remember <laughs> me and my buddy Mike. We um we got tickets to go see Giant Steelers. Uh, it was a preseason game, so it was, you know, probably mid to end of August. I want to say this is 1994. Uh, so I was 17 years old, um, 93, 94 time frame. So I was driving, though, and we're like, let's try to get some fucking beer. Let's see. We're going to go tailgate. And every avenue we went down, we were stonewalled. We couldn't get any, any beer to go tailgate at the Giants game. So we're like, let's, let's smoke. Let's smoke cigarettes. For some reason, we're like, let's do some kind of derelict behavior at the game because that's what you do. So we went, we bought a carton of Newports and we fucking smoked like champs one after another. We just smoked and smoked and smoked as many of the cigarettes as we could nonstop tailgating at the Giants game. And then like f until the carton was out, like that's what we did. We just smoked cigarettes for like a week. And I still remember I'm driving. I had a 1983 Monte Carlo and I'm driving to my Monte Carlo and I'm leaving the development. I had a cigarette in my mouth and my parents' friends turned from Route 34 onto Farrington Road. I could still see it in my mind. And they looked at me with a cigarette in my hand, like out of the window with such like disgust, like what a dirtbag this guy is. And I look at myself in the mirror, I'm like, wait a second, I'm not a smoker. I threw it out and I never touched another cigarette again for my, my whole life. <laughs> but it's like, I, I smoked like it was my job for like a week, a carton of Newports. Um, yep, I hated them when I yeah. first started smoking and I didn't even, I was choking on them, I was gagging, puking, but I ended up being a smoker for years after that. Years. Yep. 
And then when you when you add in other unhealthy habits with with the drinking and you know that whole thing yeah. and then overeating or having a relationship with food that you live to eat not eat to live kind of thing you know when when it becomes more of it's it's meeting a like a psychological need that you have and food is going to be the thing that cures it for you um oh it's the dopamine release dennis yes. it was um that was exactly what it was it was uh that that release of comfort of of you know food to taste to enjoyment i would get out of work and i would on my way home and it was like afternoon it was before dinner time on my way home i would grab a uh, large steak bomb large steak and cheese uh, extra cheese extra mushrooms i'll get a large pepperoni and mushroom pizza extra cheese and a two liter bottle of diet coke because i mean you need to drink diet coke you want to watch your figure so it made sense to get a diet soda and i would go home and i would eat all of that and i would drink the whole two liter and then looking back you know years ago when i would tell that story of what i used to eat i used to get so disgusted thinking how did i how did i even fit it all number one but how did i not make myself sick i mean we're talking a two liter bottle of soda a large pizza and a large sub like that it's just disgusting how i used to eat um and now i eat even more than i used to eat before but it's the right food like a uh, hundred calories of broccoli is a giant plate of broccoli but i could do a hundred calories in you know half of a 20 ounce soda so I mean, it was just, it was disgusting, but it was the dopamine release. Yeah. Like you said, it was that emotional, that emotional fix between that and drinking to try and just no. forget about what was going on. Yeah. yeah. So it was bad. You're, um, what does your, your eating look like now? So you mentioned, you know, broccoli, like if you were to take us through, okay, this is my norm. I like, I'm, I'm a creature of habit. So there are certain things that I just eat every single day. Um, you know, yeah, I, the way I, that, that but, make me feel what's your typical, what's your day? Like, so when, when I'm on point, I'll eat the same food every meal, every day. Cause, because I know that with structure, wh where I fit in, um, my eating the last month has been absolutely horrendous, but typically, um, because like I, I was telling Dennis before we got on here, um, I did have a bout with COVID in the, in the beginning of August and when I lost my taste and I lost my smell, I didn't eat for days while I was sick, but food was not appealing to me and I couldn't taste anything or smell anything, but I could differentiate between sweet and savory. So, so anything that was salty, like potato chips, um, I would eat those cause that was the only thing that sounded good. Cause I could taste it so to speak. And I was drinking lemonade for like a week and a half oh, potato chips and lemonade. But what I eat typically um, outside of that, I am fully plant-based now. I have been for the last three years. Um, I wasn't at the beginning of my journey. The beginning of my journey, I was a ground turkey, fish, um, fresh vegetables. I used to do like a buffet-style meal prep um, where I would roast veggies and I would put them with whatever protein I wanted to do. Um, typically, I I eat my healthy fats. I you know avocados i use coconut oil things of that nature but i'm fully plant-based now so typically if i want something that's out of the realm of produce fruits uh, veggies and, and you know tofu and things of that nature i will do like impossible meat occasionally here and there beyond burgers um, and things of that nature but pretty much i'm just straight up plant-based now i i get all my protein from lentils beans chickpeas grains quinoa things of that nature so but within structure it's it works yeah. it it's i eat for myself the main reason why i went plant-based too because people always ask me and i'll get it out of the way that way people won't ask underneath the comments <laughs> the main reason was as i mentioned earlier my father had called me and told me that he had prostate cancer um, his father also suffered from prostate cancer. Well, my father has gone through two bouts of chemo for his prostate cancer. And there have been studies that have shown people who eat a plant-based diet are less likely to develop cancer in their body. And it was something that I kind of hung on to. So I had decided, I made a decision. I said, you know what, 
Um, if there's a chance being more plant-based and alkaline and things of that nature, then I won't get prostate cancer. I'm, I'm willing to eat that way. So I've been that way for the last three years. And it, once you make that decision and it, you know, it, it takes the, the uncertainty out of it, you know, once you know, like in, within that structure, I think that that does help people as well. People that are, if you're going through, you know, if you're go, getting on a new workout regimen, you know, keeping it simple, new nutrition regimen, keeping it simple. And if you're taking that out of it, especially if it's done for a specific health reason, which is, you know, prostate cancer running in your family, totally understand that to me, like, I, I don't know if I'm scared of tofu. I have no idea. I've never tried it. Before. I hated it. I, I hated tofu, man. Honestly, I literally hated tofu. So I think the biggest thing with, with me, my tofu journey, <laughs> um, I didn't know how to prepare it. So when I first started eating it, it wasn't right. So I was disgusted with it because it was just like soft, like tasteless crap like um but the key is is to get the right tofu for the right meals and if you take firm tofu and try this man i tell you what you i guarantee you like it take it and you got to press the water out of it so that it's not watery and i just dice it up i toss it in a little bit of cornstarch i throw it in the air fryer and it's like crunchy little nuggets you can put a little sauce on them if you want you can you can dress them any way you want I usually take a little bit of uh, liquid smoke and some liquid aminos, uh, so, you know, some garlic powder, things of that nature, and make myself a, a spicy little blend. I'll add a little bit of sriracha to it and some honey so it will stick to it. And I make these little nuggets out of out of it, and I'll throw it in a stir fry with some bean sprouts and all kinds of different veggies, and it's freaking delicious. But when I first started eating tofu, dude, I was you, Dennis. I was afraid of it. I didn't want to try it. And then when I did try it, I thought it was disgusting. Yeah, it just, there's something, I don't know. Maybe if I'm, I'm ever <laughs> driving, you know, through the Oklahoma City area, I'll have to stop by and, and, uh, and share some tofu with you. Who would have thought, I mean, on this adventure we went on today, we'd be talking about cigarettes and tofu. Definitely didn't have that <laughs> in my wheelhouse. I told you it's more just two dudes having a fucking conversation. We'll see We'll see where it goes. So, Craig, I wanted to um, give you an opportunity now to, um, well, one, just, Thank you for being on the podcast, man. I, I really appreciate it. I, I feel like we just no scratched the surface. I'd love to to do another episode after, you know, the audience gets to know you a little bit through this journey and just yeah. talk about helping men that are going through an abusive situation. Like what are some steps that, you know, almost like create a playbook to help people that are going through things. I, I think that we just scratched the surface right there between, you know, um, you know, to listening to your journey, but then also understanding there's there's a bigger picture that we can certainly help people with as well. So how can we go about, how can the Building Men audience find you? How can they, they um, follow along on your journey? Yeah, I'm, I'm on Facebook. Um, I have a business page. It's the Craig Daigle, the Unfiltered Life Coach. I'm on Instagram as official Craig Daigle. Um, and you can find me just about anywhere. I also have a website. I'm kind of like use it a little bit here and there yeah. it's a still under construction type of deal but it's unfilteredlifecoach.com i'm on twitter um just if you search my name i i pop up i'm i'm very well shared by our company so i'm pretty predominant uh on google searches and social media um the company beachbody shares me quite often i actually spoke at one of our our yearly events when we were having live events i spoke in front of about thirty thousand people shared bits and pieces of my story. I actually just shared uh, that video today. Again, reshared it on my Facebook page. So you can go check that out as well. But yeah, I'm, I'm just about everywhere. And if you want to, you can email me at unfilteredlifecoach at gmail.com. Was Tony Horton part of Beachbody? Tony Horton was part of Beachbody. He, uh, he just recently kind of had his uh, achievement award i think it was the same year that i spoke it was 2018 and he's he's not under contract by beachbody okay. anymore but we still have we still have the old school p90x and all that stuff but he's doing his own thing right now he's on uh xfinity and stuff like that we have a slew of new trainers um part of the beachbody platform it's all digital now so it's all online it's all streaming on everywhere and tomorrow we actually launch we're we're slowly becoming the leader in the industry of at-home fitness um we actually went 
public on the New York Stock Exchange in June. So we are publicly traded. Um, we're in four countries, and tomorrow we release our first ever stationary bike. Part of the oh, merger wow. when we went part of the merger when we went public, um, Beachbody merged with a company called Mix Fitness. So it's a, it's a much more affordable bike than the other stationary bikes that are out there. Um, and it, it actually launches tomorrow. And then we have our interactive, we're going to be doing live classes. It's actually in the beta testing right now. I'm part of the beta testing program for it where our trainers come on live. It's basically like Zoom. Um, they have the stage, but then they have a, a limited amount of people that are part of the workout behind them on the TV screens. It's like a giant studio where they're, everybody's working out in their homes and then anybody can view the class but some people can sign up to be a part of the class and the trainer literally interacts with us live right there and just kind of checks our form tells us you know what to do how to focus how to get the most out of the workout so it's been it's been absolutely a blessing it's just it's crazy that my life has gone to where it has right. and being able to be a part of it and such a big part of it has been a blessing and I have met your college um, colleague uh, several times the year that I spoke because his program was the first one that I did. So, of course, um, I had to pop in and say hello to him and everything. So it's been great. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Sean T, he wouldn't, he wouldn't remember me, um, but he, uh, I, I, knew, like, I knew of him there. He was a prominent figure back then in the late 90s in, in, in college. Tony Horton was a guy. I did the P90X program. I, you know, I, was, I was at a gym, and I, I stopped going to the gym, and I – to, this is going back probably 15 years now shit when i was doing the the p90x program and i i just recently saw him pop up on social media i was like holy shit is that tony horton like i feel like i had an intimate relationship with him because i would work i would pop on the video every single day and listen to his corny jokes and <laughs> things like that but it, it brought me back to that time in my life so that's pretty cool that you're um you know you're in that world right now after all the shit that you've been through and such a story of resiliency and perseverance that you shared with us today and again we can probably talk for five hours just on each one of those little topics i wanted to get a broad picture and then definitely have you back on at some point in the future absolutely to go on a deeper journey as well so um i appreciate everyone listening if you're um we'll put everything that craig just mentioned in the show notes so you'll be able to find him on all of his various social media platforms and his, his email address his website everything like that for Building Men, you can find us on Instagram at building.men. Email us at buildingmencoach at gmail.com. Before we go, Anthony, do you have anything else to add, my friend? Nothing. All right. So we will see you. <laughs> He's going to love this. I can't wait. I'm going to put a, a video. And before we go to Craig, I need to I need to ask you, just for promotional purposes, I need, I, I'll need a screenshot of this. You, Whenever you post, you do like the people's eyebrow. You do the fucking, the, that's what we need right there. That's that's the one. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to screenshot that and share it because you definitely put that out there all the time. Whenever I see it pop up, that's my favorite part of it right there. So we'll, we'll share all this out there. We thank you for listening so much. We, um, we want you to go a step further than you thought you can go we'll see you next time on building men